Can you continue to let people in as they come in? Thank you. All right, so welcome again to everyone who have just joined us. Uh, my name is Bridget Gregory. Again, I am the Waste Reduction and Recycling Senior Coordinator on the Homewood campus. Uh, for anyone who just joined us, please go ahead and fill out those polls real quick. Um, and welcome to the Hop Reuse Hubs Fall Lunch and Learn. So typically we do this, you know, in person, obviously. We, uh, this is our second one now virtual. So um, we're very happy to have you join us. Um, our Lunch and Learn today is going to be on um, upcycling your interior design. And I'm really excited because uh, our student intern and I put together a great presentation for you. Um, and our student today is Honor Zetzer. She is a junior in the Krieger School, double majoring in economics, environmental studies, and she's been working for us for um, over a year now. Uh, this is her second year, as she was saying, with the Hopper's Hub. And outside of working for us, she's involved in the Sustainability Leadership Council, the Economic Policy Issues Colloquium, and the Phi Beta Phi Fraternity for Women. Um, and she's been working with the Hopper Use Hub, which is a program that is uh, sponsored by the Homewood Recycling Office. That's a, a total campus reuse program. So not only do we do furniture and office wear uh, reuse, but we also do a lot of educational activities like this event. We've done fix it fairs in the past, and we do a lot of partnering with other um, organizations in the community. Um, and yeah, so we, we, we do a little bit of reuse and upcycling and um, are trying to encourage both students and staff and faculty to focus on that as well. Um, so I am going to hand over the reins to Anna right now and she's gonna start, kick off the presentation. So thank you all. All right, thanks Bridget. Um, so we're gonna start with just a quick overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. So if you wanna go to the next slide. <laughs> Unfortunately, my share screen wouldn't work. So <laughs> Bridget and I are kind of back and forth on this. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about first the importance of reuse. We're gonna go over some example projects, talking about where to find items to upcycle, um, and how to find the best items. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about using what you might already have in your home. And then we're going to talk about where you can find the tools that you need uh, to do these projects. And then we'll have like a little creativity brainstorm session at the end. Um, yeah, and through this presentation, um, if you have small comments or like immediate questions, feel free to use the chat feature. Um, and Bridget will call my attention to any immediate questions in there. All right, so starting with um, why reuse, um, as I'm sure most of you know, there are a lot of environmental benefits to reuse. Um, according to the US EPA, reduction and reuse are the most effective ways to save natural resources, protect the environment, and save money. Um, so as you can see, there are listed a lot of the environmental impacts in terms of resource use, greenhouse gas emissions, um, both in product start of life and product end of life. Um, recycling is always a good option for the environment, but um, even that can be very resource and energy intensive. So upcycling and reuse are probably the best first step if you're looking to be environmentally friendly. Okay, and with that, we're gonna just jump right into some project examples. Um, and we're gonna start with a project that I did over the summer um, on the next slide. It's the small little chair. Um, I did not build the chair, I simply reupholstered it um, because it was in my mom's office and had this like really gross old beige leathery cover on it. Um, so yeah, as you can see, there's two small cushions on the chair. And what I did is I unhinged the cushions from the chair. It was pretty easy chair to disassemble. Um, and all I needed was a staple gun, pliers, fabric, and a screwdriver to take the cushions off the chair. Um, 
using the pliers, I pulled the old staples out of the cushions so I could remove the old cover. Um, as you can see, so there's this picture here, which is kind of what the situation was. It was a wooden um, chair piece with like a cushion on top of it. So the, sta the fabric was stapled into the wood. So I just pulled out the uh, staples, pulled off the old fabric, folded the new fabric over and re-stapled it. Um, yeah, and then I have this really cute little chair um, that I have at one of my desks in my room. Um, so this is a very small little project, um, but was super easy to do. Um, it kind of sounds intimidating when I would tell my friends, oh, I reupholstered this chair by myself. They'd be like, you reupholstered a chair? Um, it can be as simple as just unstapling and restapling fabric. So, um, and next, Bridget is gonna talk about a project that she's done. Um, take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, my husband and I, uh, two or three Christmases ago, decided, you know, we're going to um, do upcycled Christmas gifts for everyone. And I decided I really wanted to get into palette projects. So um, these are examples of the things that we created. And so we made this, uh, what is, I think, supposed to be a Christmas card wreath holder. Um, this uh, looks like a really fat shark <laughs> picture for my sister. And this is like a weird caddy slash bookshelf slash wine holder, whatever you'd like it to be. So um, some information on palettes. So there's lots of ways that you can upcycle and reuse palettes, but a um, couple notes for anyone who's never done a palette project but are interested, all palettes are not created equal. So you definitely want to do research on which palettes to use if you're thinking about using a palette um, and where to get them. So there are some grocery stores have palettes, department stores, local hardware stores. Don't go to um, like Home Depot or Lowe's because they you to buy lumber and they're not going to be interested in giving it to you. At least that was our experience. I mean, you can try it. But uh, we tried going to Home Depot and they were like, no, we're not going to give you our pellets. Uh, but other places uh, might be willing to give you some of their pellets. Um, and then when you're looking at the pellets, um, you want to look for certain things. There's some of them will have labels. Um, I would tell you to be wary if it's not labeled at all to not use it or use it at your own risk because um, Palettes have been used to transport lots of things. And so theoretically, they shouldn't be dirty. They shouldn't be infected, but you don't know. You don't know where it's been. You don't know how many times it's been reused. So you want to be careful. Um, you want to look for a label like this. Um, when you're looking at a label like this, there's certain things that you want to look at. So um, if you're looking over here at some of the codes that might be on the label, things like db meaning that it's been debarked wood um which is means it's been untreated and it's safe um so that's like the db down here then you've got the ht these were the ones that we looked for when we were picking pallet wood um and like these are generally in the pallet community the safest pallets to use for upcycle projects especially if it's something that you're going to use in your house and you're going to keep in your house um so you want to look for debarked or heat treated um Kiln drying, I've read, is also okay, but anything else with the uh, EUR, MB, those are ones you definitely want to stay away from because they've been treated with some sort of toxins. Usually, they are no longer allowed to be made anymore, but there's still some that are circulating from before those restrictions were put into place. Other note, don't ever use colored pellets because they are typically owned by a, a third party company. And so companies aren't going to be likely to let you take them, number one. And number two, colored pellets are typically treated with some sort of chemical. So you don't want to use them. Just FYI, if you are curious about pellet working projects, do some research uh, to make sure that you're comfortable and you know where you're getting them from. And I don't mean to scare anybody, but just to like a little public advisory. You know. Uh, statement there. But there's lots of things that you can do with palettes and they are really great um, resources once you uh, are comfortable 
using them. So just some like things to have on hand when you're working with palettes. You definitely want to have a mask, which now like everybody has a mask, so you're fine with that. Work gloves because you're dealing with wood and it's usually um, not very fine, you know, it's rough wood, so you definitely want to have gloves. And then you want to have some sort of goggle protective eyewear so that when you're sanding, you don't get anything in your eye. Um, and then usually when you're working with palettes, you got to break them down. And so there's lots of different ways to break down palettes. You can be really fancy. And if you're like going to do lots of palette projects, go and buy a palette breaker. I think it's anywhere from like 40 to a hundred bucks, depending on how fancy you want to get. We didn't really go that route because we didn't know how many palettes we were going to do. Uh, we started with the crowbar and hammer, but that is a really labor intensive way of working on um, breaking down palettes. Um, and we decided, nope, we don't really want to do that. So we want the Cirque Saw um, way, and that's really an easy way to break your pellets apart without having to do too much labor. But you want to make sure for anything that you have a bucket or some sort of container to collect rusty nails, because especially on older pellets, um, things fall apart and just a nice, safe way to collect things. Um, so that's just for like deconstructing it. So once you have it deconstructed, you can use everything to make all sorts of different things. So I listed over here and I forgot we meant to say this earlier, but we are gonna share our slides with everybody after this event. So um, you'll have this resource for you and any kind of resources that we found to prepare for this event, we will share with you as well in a follow-up email. Um, but some just some tools for projects for using pellet wood. Carpenter's pencil, measuring tape, straight edge, saw horses are very handy. Uh, you don't need all of these, but they're just like suggestions of what I found were useful. Um, sandpaper or a sander from coarse, medium, and then fine. As you're going through working with the wood, you wanna make sure that you get it sanded down. Um, hammer and nails, screwdriver, screws, whatever your preference is, wood glue if you'd rather not do anything with uh, hardware. Um, you definitely want to invest in some sort of varnish to seal the uh, wood, um, especially because you don't know where, again, it's come from. So if, if you're going to keep it in the house, you might want to varnish it. If it's going outside, you're not as big a concern. Um, and then paint, paint brushes. So for this sign that we did over here, uh, we deconstructed the palette first and um, had, uh, we decided like what size we wanted the sign to be and cut the pieces down to the size that we wanted. And then, um, you know, palette wood's not all the same size pieces. So you kind of have to figure out, okay, like it's not gonna look perfect. And that's kind of part of the, the aesthetic value of using palettes. So, you want to find pieces that fit well together. Um, and then you want to cut a couple extra pieces for the back as your connector. So these two pieces here are our connector pieces. Um, we sanded everything down uh, before we attached them all together. And then you nail or um, screw everything together and then you sand it down again because once you nail and screw things, wood um, comes apart and rears its ugly head. So you want to sand everything down again. And then uh, varnish everything and then paint. Um, and I'm happy to get into questions if people have questions or anything about any of this, but um, lots of fun. Okay, thank you, Bridget, for that example. I know there are a lot of wood pallets out there. They're a huge source of waste in a lot of industry. So um, really great to, there's a lot of projects that you can do with those, so. Now we're going to go into some of the other examples that we found through some of our research, just highlighting some of the coolest projects we found you can make for your workspace or anywhere in your home. Um, so to start, whiteboards out of picture frames. So I thought this was a really cool um, project example, and it doesn't have to be a whiteboard. As you can see, the picture on the right um, they painted over the glass of the picture frame with chalk paint, so they made a chalkboard instead. Um, but really, you just place paper behind the glass, um, so you have like kind of a uniform surface. The example on the left, they like put 
like calendar paper behind, so it was all sectioned off really nicely. Um, but even just a plain piece of paper, and then you just write on it with uh, dry erase markers, and you can wipe it off. And um, it's a little bit fancier looking than just your standard store bought whiteboard too. So that was a really cool project. Um, next, we're going to talk about um, dresser drawers, which I had no idea were such a versatile piece of old furniture parts, but as you can see in the pictures, there are so many things you can do with old dresser drawers. Um, so the picture furthest on the right was the most popular use that I saw, just pulling out a dresser drawer, um, maybe decorating the back of it, and then putting like a shelf or two in, turning it on its side, and you have like a mini shelf. Um, I saw some examples of that mini shelf mounted on the wall next to a bed, and you have kind of a floating nightstand. Um, in that picture, it's in a bathroom. Um, alternatively, you can stack the shelves kind of um, opposite of each other because of the drawer front. Um, and they made this really cool, like just tall, thin bookshelf. Um, you can um, kind of just mount the drawers and they kind of made like shadow boxes out of old drawers. Um, and then this last example all the way to the left um, looks like they just mounted the drawers the way that they would be in the dresser, but no longer in the dresser, as you can see, and they have a lot more um, vertical space. So like in that top one, they had stuff st stacked up really high. Um, yeah, so those are just a few examples of different shelving types of things that you can do with old dresser drawers. Um, but there's also things outside of shelving that you can do with old dresser drawers too. Um, in terms of just repairing worn down furniture, there's a lot of potential in upcycling where you don't really have to do a lot of work other than take what's already there and make it look a bit nicer. Um, so old filing cabinets in the um, resource sheet that we're gonna be emailing out to you, um, this, or in this bright orange file cabinet, um, I'm gonna be linking the blog post that I found where that was like this disgusting old rusty file cabinet. And if you find file cabinets at any like furniture reuse center, most of the time they're like rusty and kind of gross. Um, and obviously that bright orange, it looks beautiful and that would definitely be something you'd want in your home. Um, and it's possible to make those things look nice again. Um, and some of these other examples, um, uh, fi fixing up a chair, um, just decorating um, existing furniture, painting it different colors so that it's new to you, new to your space, feels fresher. Um, there's a lot that can be done with like drawer handles and knobs um, that can just make pieces look more unique. Um, as the example on the bottom right is just drawer knobs made out of like polished rocks. Um, and there's like lots of random things you can use like door knockers, door knobs. Um, and it makes pieces of furniture look really cool, unique um, without really having to put too much work into it. Um, you can always update desk surfaces in terms of just repainting them, putting a glass cover on them. Um, or you can do kind of mosaics or decorations. Uh, when I was a kid, my mom had this like glass cover on the top of my desk and I would always change out the papers that I had underneath to decorate so that I, cause as I got older and my interest in like my vibe changed or whatever, I would change the pictures underneath so it could like fit a new room look without my mom having to invest in new furniture. Um, or this example on the screen, it looked like a mosaic tabletop um, but the example there was just cut up pieces of paper and they put those on their desktop and then put a smooth surface over it. And it looks really cool. Um, yeah, next slide now. <laughs> um, turning old utensils into wall books is a very popular example that I saw through lots of stuff on Pinterest. Um, which um, seems intimidating in terms of the metal bending aspect. But if you do a small bit of research, um, 
it really didn't seem like it was that hard to do the metal bending. Um, at least the blog writers made it sound relatively simple. Um, and it can create a really cool looking set of hooks in your house. Um, T-shirt rugs are a great thing to make, um, especially for kids rooms, playrooms. Excess T-shirts is probably something that all of us have somewhere in our house, no matter how many times we bring stuff to the donation center. Um, and oftentimes a lot of stuff that goes to donation centers will end up going to waste in the end. So it's always great to try and find out a way that you can use the piece on your own before sending away. Um, and t-shirt rugs are very cool looking, as you can see in that example. Um, and it's always cool to say, oh, I made that myself. <laughs> um, you can make coat racks and hat racks. That was an example that I saw a lot using um, any sort of column. Uh, some of the cool examples I saw were using stair banisters because they're already usually relatively decorative. Um, and then you just put a couple hooks on it and then you've got a coat or hat rack. Um, and then using old baking tins uh, was a very popular choice for making little shelving units for food display or for desktop storage. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, where to find pieces to upcycle if you wanna to go to the next slide. Is it this slide, Honor? Um, the one where to find pieces to upcycle? Yes. Oh, hold on, my screen sharing paused. Sorry. <laughs> we go. All right. Sorry about so, that. <laughs> no worries. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about the different resources for finding pieces. If you don't already have something in your home that you want to improve or upcycle, um, where to find those pieces for projects that you want to pursue. So places like Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, free and for sale pages, um, local buy nothing pages, all of those types of online community resource sharing platforms are really good places to find pieces. And a great strength of those is that you can usually negotiate prices with people who are selling stuff. I need to find a lot of free things as well. Um, on Etsy, you can find project ideas and you can also find um, purchasing items and also like scrap material. So if you don't really need something that's put together, then you can find pieces of wood, pieces of yarn, whatever you might need. Um, yard sales and estate sales, people just selling things from their homes, um, thrift stores, furniture consignment shops, which are just like nicer thrift stores. Um, borrowing or taking things from family and friends, um, finding things in dumpsters and on the side of the road at your own risk, but sometimes you can find some great gem pieces there, especially things that someone else thought was trash, but after this presentation, you'll know that you can actually upcycle it and reuse it. <laughs> um, or reuse centers, architectural salvage places. A couple examples in Baltimore are the loading dock and scrap be more um, where they just collect things that can be reused, uh, ranging from furniture items, appliances to more scrap material type things. And one note, somebody just mentioned in the chat room, um, Habitat Restore, which is another great resource as well for some of these um, items. So I know a lot of people are mentioning some of these in the chat room too, so. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right, so a few tips uh, when you're buying things secondhand. Um, of those places we just mentioned, different places have different strengths. Um, so thrift stores are normally gonna have a constantly rotating supply and also things ranging from furniture to the tiniest little shelf knickknacks um, thrift stores have it all. 
And if you go back, if you have like one concept or idea in mind, if you go back once a week, you will be faced with basically a new store a lot of the times that you go in. Um, so that's a benefit of thrift stores. Consignment stores usually have very high quality pieces, um, unique pieces. They've done all the work of filtering out anything that they've decided doesn't have potential. So you'll go in there and find some of the best pieces out there that other people don't want and you might want for your space. Estate sales, um, usually very similar to yard sales, but if you can find an estate sale, uh, they'll usually have a lot more furniture than your standard yard sale um, because estate sales are usually just trying to empty out the house at that point. Facebook groups, like I mentioned before, um, Facebook groups and all other online forums, it's easy to negotiate prices. Um, one of the things to look out for though is that sometimes it's hard to determine the quality of the item, especially if you don't get to see it in person before you pick it up. Um, and then reuse centers, they have usually more access to just collections of scrap materials or raw materials than places like thrift stores or consignment stores um, or Facebook groups because a lot of those other stores are just selling items, whereas reuse centers are trying to fuel your project essentially. So they'll have full items, pieces of furniture, but they'll also have probably more scrap materials as well. Um, our second tip is relating to how to look at the pieces that you're looking at. So like I said, uh, with Facebook groups, it can be hard to evaluate pieces. Well, what would you be evaluating about a piece? Um, there are certain things you wanna check for. So we wanna test the drawers of shelving units or file cabinets to make sure they open um, and open smoothly. Uh, doors, knobs, wheels, wobbly loose legs, kind of all of those little kinks that furniture might have in it. You just wanna be aware of what you're getting. If it's something you can fix, then great. Um, but you wanna know if that's a problem or not. Sitting in chairs is a great way to gauge sturdiness. You might feel weird walking around the store sitting in every single chair, um, but it'll be worth it. Looking over upholstery on chairs um, is also important and testing zippers if there's any zippers. Um, if you can try and find a brand on furniture, especially wood furniture, um, and it can tell you the maker um, and other signs of higher quality construction, um, Nailed or screwed joints are usually lower quality than dove joints, um, according to every single page on the internet that I can find regarding high quality construction identification. Um, and there are, I'm not an expert in construction, so there's lots more to look out for. Um, a quick Google search can help you in identifying that. Also make sure that you're cleaning pieces thoroughly before you bring them inside your living space, even if they look clean, um, especially today, we know about the importance of knowing what we're bringing into our home. Um, and then also just be aware of how much time and skill you're willing to put into a piece. Um, like I said, when you're testing for those little kinks, um, if it's something that you just don't think that you have the time or the skill to put into upcycling, then don't take the piece. Um, don't clutter your home, bring it into your space, and then toss it after you realize that you don't know how to do or don't want to do what's necessary to make it like a usable piece of furniture. So just being aware of that and being aware of where each piece fits into um, in terms of your range of realistic projects. And then finally, our last tip when you are thrifting is to get creative. Um, as you can see in these examples on the side, uh, there are so many ways to use things that you've never thought of before. And of course, with practice and experience, uh, you get more used to thinking outside the box, but really push yourself as you're looking at pieces in thrift stores or even pieces around your home to come up with what might be possible for them. Um, as you can see, they made crutches into a shelf. Um, 
Who knew? So next we're gonna talk more about using what you already have in your home. So some of this creativity plays into that. There's a lot of things that you already have in your home um, that you can use to create pieces, uh, new pieces or different spaces um, without even having to go through the process of finding pieces and evaluating them and et cetera. Um, so checking for more general pieces such as jars, mason jars, candle jars, um, so much that you can do with jars. And you probably have a lot of them. If you ever started washing out pasta jars, salsa jars, pickle jars, after you use them, uh, which I started doing just like a year ago. And now I have so many jars and I don't know what to do with them. Um, so many jars go through a household. Um, so you probably have way more than you're aware of. Or if you started collecting, you'll have a lot and you can start doing a project very quickly. Um, picture frames, fabric scraps, like I was saying, old t-shirts. Many of us have too many old t-shirts and we can handle um, old CDs. If you still have some CDs from the olden days and probably don't have a way to play them anymore or don't really care about what's on them. Um, it can be used for cool projects and decorative items. Um, in terms of storing items, just as simple as having a box or a couple bins for smaller items. Um, that you can just collect as you no longer need them anymore. And don't overlook those small things like rubber bands, clips, laundry clips, shoelaces. Those are the small things that you might need while you're doing a project. And you probably just assume you have them in your house and then you start looking for them. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I don't have any clips to do this small part of this project. Um, so those are important things that you can just have on hand. Um, you'll usually get them in other items already. So instead of tossing them, just putting them in a bin, collecting them for whatever you'll need later. Um, and if you ever get to a point where you collected so much and you really don't think you have time for a project right now, or maybe you haven't spent a lot of time collecting items in your home, um, but you have a couple ideas that you really want to pursue, uh, just swapping with friends and family can be really useful. Uh, either just reaching out to people saying, hey, do you want this box of buttons that I have? Or setting up an event where everyone comes together to swap items virtually for now, uh, maybe in the future in person, which would be probably a more fun environment where everyone just brings items that they don't really have a use for anymore and you can just swap them with friends and family who might have ideas for how to reuse them before sending them to donation centers. And lastly, the last thing you'll need for your projects is tools, which is on the next slide. Yes, okay. And again, in terms of tool resources, um, friends, neighbors, family, really good resource for tools if you don't have a screwdriver or a pair of pliers or something like that. Um, Facebook groups, Nextdoor, those types of online sharing forums. Um, there are a couple places that have rental programs for renting tools, especially some of those bigger ones that you don't really expect to need outside of like one project. Um, and if you can't find any friends or family who already have something, then places like the Baltimore Tool Bank have rental um, and borrowing systems. And also for anywhere in the country, Home Depot also has um, this project program is the word I'm looking for, <laughs> a rental program. Um, or if it's something that you determine that you want to use in lots of projects in the future, you can always find used uh, tools to buy uh, online or at resale shops. Um, and those are the steps I would encourage you taking before running to the hardware store and buying a new tool, especially if you don't expect to use it too many times. 
And I'll and, just add real quickly, nope. sorry, just one second. Um, yeah. If you end up getting a tool and you're like, you use it a couple times, you say, I don't, I don't need this anymore. I don't want it anymore. You can take tools to some of these, you know, obviously you can offer them on Facebook or some of those groups, but there are organizations like the Baltimore Tool Bank uh, or um, the Station North Tool Library in Baltimore um, that will accept secondhand tools uh, as part of their like borrowing program too. So that's another thing. Okay, so um, next we just wanna highlight, like we were saying, there are some pieces in your home or that you might find in thrift stores that are particularly versatile for being used in any different type of project. Just having them on hand, um, you can use them right away for something that you find on Pinterest or wherever else. Um, in terms of jars, mason jars, candle jars, food jars, like I said, um, t-shirts, picture frames, kitchen items like silverware, um, plates, food containers um, can be used for a lot of decorative um, and, and also practical useful like you can turn silverware into hooks, you can turn um, old baking tins into shelves, etc. cetera. Um, wood pallets, like Bridget was talking about earlier in the presentation, and dressers and their drawers, like we pointed out, there's endless uses for dressers and their drawers. Um, So rather than breaking out into breakout rooms, um, which we were kind of going back and forth on, um, I think right now we should just take the opportunity to kind of open up the conversation to everybody and um, just see if anybody has any questions about anything that we talked about up to this point. Anybody has some additional ideas they want to share. Um, I was seeing some um, ideas being shared in the chat room a little bit, um, but if someone has something they verbally, audibly would like to share, that's totally fine, and just please feel free to unmute yourself. I was noticing um, some people were mentioning for like prepping things like mason jars, and thank you, Leanna, for posting um, the tip on how to uh, prep those. Um, someone else says like boiling them in hot water, right? Simmering them in a big stock pot, um, which is a great idea. And I think one of the things uh, Honor and I were talking about, which is why we had the slide on, you know, what to do or where to store things. Thank you, Jane. Um, where to store things before you're ready to do a project. One of the hardest um hardest parts of reusing things is creating a sustainable routine, you know, creating a spot for you to put these items in your home so that you will use them again and you know where to look for them and they're ready for that project. Um, and so, you know, keeping those glass jars, prepping them ahead of time and putting them into some sort of container where you can use them again, um, is, is going to help you in the long run. And it will help you make the step to um, do a upcycle project. Um, so does anybody have any other projects that they've worked on that they would like to share after listening to us talk about some of the ones that we've worked on or ideas that they're going to do? Uh, Richard, I think you're trying to talk and you're on mute. You know, I'm, I'm working off my phone because um, I had audio issues. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So so actually, I, I, I went by a consignment shop and uh, I I needed to upgrade my, my home, you know, office space because of, you know, working from home and found a really uh, a nice piece of uh, it was a hardwood door that we had about six, uh, six um, coats of, of paint on it. But, uh, and I had no idea what kind of wood it was, but the fact that it was really heavy told me it was a hardwood and it turned out to be this really beautiful grain, um, uh, you know, uh, piece that was 
plenty large enough uh, for for a nice desk. And I just refinished that and and bought a um, one of these uh, hand crank up and down, you know, stand up, sit down uh, platforms. So I'm just about to install that and and actually have a, a healthier, <laughs> more spacious uh, work desk at, at home. Great. No, and you bring up a good point. And it, it kind of going back to what Honor was mentioning earlier, when you're looking at consignment shops or at used furniture, heavier wood tends or heavier objects tend to um, equate to quality <laughs> when it comes especially to wood. And that's really when you're talking about upcycling and reusing something, having a good solid wood is way more handy and trustworthy than like a laminate based item. So awesome. Well, that is congrats on your new project completion and your new ergonomic desk space, hopefully. Um, anybody else have anything they'd like to share? And I will just put a pin note in here. Um, I don't know if anybody's known, but the Hot Breeze Hub right now is doing a furniture giveaway to JHU employees, which all of you are. Um, and we are moving locations. And so we are trying to reduce the amount of furniture that we're moving to our new location. So we are giving stuff away. We have a lot of filing cabinets left if people are interested. We have a good chunk of bookshelves that are left if people are interested in. Um, I will put the link to the online inventory in the chat room. Uh, so in case anybody's interested. If that coat rack is still down there, I'm totally putting dibs on that thing. There is, I think, one metal coat rack. The wooden one, I think, is gone. Metal, mine. Okay. <laughs> All right. Does anyone else have any other projects that they've done, or Ellie? I had to unmute myself there. So um, I had the same issue that Richard was talking about where I was working at a rather um, substandard home office desk arrangement. So I, I went on online and found a, um, what was a perfectly decent Ethan Allen desk. And, and I'm sure anybody else would have just left it, but I, I had to, um, I had to make it my own. So I'm just going to show you this nice desk that I've got here with all my stuff on it. So that worked out really well. That was, it was a hundred dollar desk. And then I probably put another 20, $30 into it in paint. And, um, and it's lovely and it works nice and I feel like a grown up and and uh, and then behind me is another piece that I got online this little bookshelf there it's like 30 bucks and will it win awards for being fine furniture no but it works yes there are lots and lots of furniture people are selling online on Facebook. I mean, as a college student, I just moved into a house with some friends for the semester and we exclusively furnished it using the free and for sale page for students. So there's lots that you can find online. Um, or if you really wanna go the unique route, something like Richard's project, um, using things outside of the box. Um, and those types of pieces are always fun to have in your house because they're very, rag worthy and you can always show people them and it always makes you seem very thrifty all right does anyone have any other questions things they want to share um I'll share. so i have not completed this yet but i have been wanting to make um glasses out of wine bottles for a really long time i um, uh, somebody purchased these for me and I've also, um, they were an award, uh, a green blue Jay award, um, a couple of years ago, um, for all the, all the attendees got glasses made out of wine bottles. So I finally, I didn't buy this used, so shame on me, but I 
will certainly offer it up to anybody when I'm done if they want to borrow it. So it gets a lot of life out of it rather than you having to buy your own. But I bought a bottle cutter. So um, I have, like I said, I haven't used it yet, but essentially that's why I was looking into removing labels, but essentially you, um, you know, put it on this thing and it's got a cutter and you can decide where you want to cut it and then you roll it. And um, interestingly, it doesn't actually cut it. It just scores it. And then you have to heat it up, I think with um, a flame and then you put it in water and then it just is supposed to separate. Um, and then I was realizing that not only can you make glasses out of it, but um, a lot of people will put um, light bulbs, like a string light down in the top, and then you can have really interesting, um, really interesting lighting. So I, um, I've been storing a lot of wine bottles <laughs> thanks to COVID. <laughs> um, and, but I did read that it's, you, you generally in the beginning have about a 30% success rate. So um, hopefully, um, with all the bottles that I've stored, I can, I can get, um, a good number of them. And then I'm going to give them away for, um, Christmas gifts because I already have a bunch of these glasses, which is why I was inspired to make them. So I will, I'll let you know how it goes. And if anybody, um, is interested in doing this and is starting to store bottles and would like to borrow my, my, my cutter, you can borrow it, contact me. Um, they weren't expensive, but again, if we're trying to reduce people buying new things, I'm happy to share. So, Lana, this is this is Rich. That's a really cool idea. How do you deal with uh, um, just making sure that you don't cut your lips or your tongue? Uh, you know, just just softening the edges. So yeah, it's supposed to score it quite cleanly, but then I think you just sand it. Um, like the this here is, um, I don't know. Even when we got them, it was really a soft um, edge. Um, so I, I, it didn't, the cutter itself did not come with, um, any particular sanding stuff. I haven't read the directions completely. I've watched a couple of videos, but I only watched it to the point where they broke the glass from, you know, when they separated it. Um, so I do need to do some more research before I start drinking out of the glasses, <laughs> but, um, but I think that, yeah, I think you just kind of sand it. it. It does look like it has a little bit of scratching around the edges um, from where it was probably sanded after it was cut and scored. I'll need to have a live stream of that process when you start trying it. So, you know, I have like really been talking about this with Bridget for so long that I yeah. actually suggested that I would do it and do a video of it and share it. Um, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get to it. <laughs> There's other, other things that I, that I, uh, project that I was working on, but I will, I promise I will record it and, um, and we'll share it. We'll do like an Instagram thing or something like that, or I'll share it to the group. Yeah. We'll, we'll send, send out a video post your Christmas holiday. I've seen it also, people have done it with like candles where they put candles in them too after they're done and things like that. And so Melissa just mentioned in the chat room that someone used like a string to score it, like a heated up string. I've seen that too, like a metal, um, but I don't know like what temperature you have to get it up to. Cause I was thinking that might be another way to sand it down too if you heat it. That's almost like blowing, but I don't, that might be a little technical. I think sandpaper is the safest way to go. <laughs> Uh, but that's a great idea too. I um, talking about projects, trying to prep for like Christmas gifts because that's something we're going to be posting about soon. Our holiday gifts is um, I've been collecting like honor all these mason jars recently. We have we um, made all of the food for our baby, but um, some people gave us mason jar um, little baby containers of baby food and things, and so they're all glass jars. And so we've been collecting them, and we're going to to label them all and put um, little plants in them. That's what we're going to do this year for our gifts to people. Is everybody gets like a a painted mason jar with a plant in it or something? So keeping it simple, um, but reused, not recycled. Um, Anybody else have any other thoughts that they'd like to share with us?
I will actually share something very yeah. quickly that I forgot to mention earlier when I was talking about t-shirts. Um, so I, like I said, like most people have a lot of t-shirts, especially as a college student, you get free t-shirts at like every event or every club that you ever attend or are part of. So it gets a little overwhelming. Um, so what I did one of the times that I was purging a lot of the t-shirts out of my drawers um, was I took the old t-shirts that I had and I cut them up and sewed them into these little produce bags for when I go grocery shopping um, because a huge thing that I always hate is coming home from the grocery store with all of my like you know organic produce because I'm trying to be sustainable um, but it's all in like these flimsy plastic bags um, so I found those super super useful I just cut them some of them are smaller some of them are bigger um, and sewed them along the edges and on some of them I used fabric paint to decorate them a little bit um, and so it helps with not having to use those flimsy plastic bags for produce at the grocery store and also sometimes I get compliments on them from the people as I'm checking out so um, and that's a great use just with old fabric scraps from t-shirts that I was getting rid of anyway so um, that is my big tip for people. Make bags out of your t-shirts. <laughs> I like that. And and I think, you know, um, again, as we get into the holiday season and we get into um, where we are giving stuff, but also getting stuff, that's a great thing to consider. Um, you know, would like, I would love something like that. If somebody would make those for me, <laughs> part of the problem is I don't have the time to make all of these things that I forget. And then when I have the time, I'm like, wait, what was the list of things that I said I wanted to do with these random things in my house? So um, that's great. Another thing that I was just thinking as you were saying with t-shirts um, is I got into a thing a couple years ago where I um, gathered up like t-shirts for everybody in my house and I like, I paid, I did not make them myself. I will admit that I don't have that much time or skills, but um, had t-shirt blankets made. And so like we did one for my parents, um, my siblings and I all like took old t-shirts from trips we had been on and gave that to them as like a big Christmas gift one year and they loved it. And like we've done it, I did it for my husband a couple of years ago from his high school and college days and he loved that. So like things like that too are great ways to reuse items in your home um, sometimes they can be decorative like the ones that the blanket we gave for my parents is like a huge statement piece in their house that they've hung on the wall so um, things like that can also be ways to kind of just freshen up spaces in your home so cool well thank you all for joining us today I think there's some great ideas that were shared and hopefully we've inspired you to try something new in your house um or you know in your home and um i'm just going to post um some closing polls real briefly um as we mentioned earlier um we'll be sharing a follow-up email next week with the recording from today as well as some resources that we have um just to help you with your projects your future projects and if you do anything in the future let us know we'd love to learn about like what you're working on you know, thank you to Elliot and Richard for sharing the things that you've been uh, working on in your house and like ways that you've been able to um, spiff up through a little reuse in your home and um, feel free to keep sharing with us because we like sharing those with other people too. Um, and it doesn't seem like we're going to be out of working in our homes anytime soon. So the more the merrier and the more we can, you know, make spaces uh, charming and inviting, the better I think we will all feel working in them continuously. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll say, you know, have a good rest of your Friday. Have a nice weekend. And thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.